welcome to the Motorsport Coaching Podcast, sponsored by Motivate Training and Management. This is a podcast where we talk to drivers and industry experts to help you maximize your performances on and off the track. Let's get started with today's show. Hi guys, and welcome to episode 49 of the Motorsport Coaching Podcast. I am your host, Belinda Risley, and today I'm joined by Clayton Kingman from the UK. Clayton has an awesome story to share with you today where he's gone from being a fan of motorsport, sending out a tweet, and becoming a successful racing car driver. He's also driven at the Festival of Speed, and he's an ambassador to the Mexican supercar manufacturer, VUHL. He's forged a successful career in the automotive, motorsports, and esport industry, utilizing the skills he's learned throughout his journey, including his involvement in the world famous, ah, uh, world fastest gamer. Please help me welcome Clayton to the show. So Clayton, welcome to the show. Hi, nice to, uh, nice to be on it. It's uh, always, a, always a pleasure to, uh, to reach new audiences and speak to new people. Well, yes, it's very new to me. As I was just saying off air, um, this whole world of gaming is completely new to me. So I can't wait to hear about your awesome story about how you became the world's fastest gamer. But before we get started, I've got the fast four questions from our um, sponsor, Plus Fitness. What is your favourite racetrack? Um, I'm going to say my favourite racetrack is one I've never driven, um, which is very strange. But yes. um, Bathurst is, oh, is my no. You can't say um, that. <laughs> yeah. All right, tell us why. <laughs> just, it just looks incredible. Um, just the whole mountain section is, yeah, it, for me, it's just the, the top of the bucket list. Very closely followed by Spa, but top of the bucket list, probably because I've never driven it. Yeah. Uh, and so is that a big goal going forward to come? Absolutely, to yeah, one of the, uh, or something? Yeah. yeah, one of the goals um, absolutely is to, to come out and do the 12-hour the race. Wow, all right, pineapple on pizzas? Awful question. Um, it shouldn't <laughs> even be a question. Uh, absolute no, no. Uh, everyone else has said yes so far. No, uh, one for the no. Must be a, okay. must be a cultural thing. Uh, <laughs> yes, it must be. Now, I'm going to say Ford or Holden, but I don't think you guys have that rivalry over there. Uh, no, not not really. Um, I'm, I would say Ford, though, just because um, I'm a big Scotty McLaughlin fan, so uh, the Mustangs uh-huh. are... Uh, are doing their business over there. So, yeah, Ford for me. Ford for you. And fruit or veggies? Um, fruit, I think. Yeah, definitely fruit. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Clayton. Well, let's get started down to the business end of things. Um, you do have an awesome story to tell, um, but how did you get started in motorsports full stop? And, um, yeah, and then talk us through your journey to where you are today. Yeah, so... Um, I've always been a fan of motorsport. My family and, and I've never been that big into motorsport. I think I went to my first race when I was probably about eight. Um, and it was only because my, my father's uh, company that he worked for had sponsored a, a car and uh, I managed to, to go. And I was, I was kind of captured then, um, probably as much in the smell as anything else. Um, and then never thought I would, uh, I would compete in motorsport. Mm-hmm. Um, but then one day I put a completely random tweet out um, and ended up meeting a guy who could build a car. I wanted to race. Um, neither of us had any money. So um, we spent the next three or four months just talking, just you know, becoming friendly. And then one day I said, Let, let's prove a point that you don't have to be from a wealthy background to get into motorsport. And uh, he said, no, no it's, it's not possible. Uh, and I said, yeah, you know, let's let's prove a point. So I went out and raised the sponsorship to having never even done a track day um, to build a car uh, with him and, and go racing. And wow. then that's Oh, sorry. What did your tweet say? Like, how did the conversation start? It was, um, rather embarrassingly, it was some Avengers pyjama bottoms um, <laughs> that I got for Christmas. Um, and he tweeted back the uh, the matching slippers. Um, And that was that, Uh, just six degrees of separation, I guess. Um, Yeah, so so we went from there. He lived 
two, two and a half hours away from me. So every other weekend I'd travel up and help build the car. And then we, I did my race license here at Silverstone. Um, and then we finished the car at four o'clock in the morning of the first race. Um, slept in my car at Silverstone, straight to the driver's briefing. Um, the car wouldn't start on the morning, so left the guys to, to try and fix it. And we only had the budget for one set of tyres. So we had to decide whether we went with wet tyres um, or, or dry. It was very wet um, on, on the Saturday of, of qualifying, mm-hmm. so we didn't have much choice. Um, so, yeah, they were waiting in the queue whilst everyone was going out qualifying, and we arrived about five minutes after qualifying had started. So it was uh, certainly interesting, but we were, we were third in class. I think we qualified, um, which, was, which was really good. And then that's kind of led me to to do all sorts um, demonstrations in the the James Hunt Lotus that was used in the film Rush. Um, I, I met the family that owned that. They just moved across from Canada, and uh, the father had just passed away. And I said, "What what are you doing with the car now?" And they said, "Ah, oh, but well, we don't really know. You know, my uh, my father he wanted to to take it up Goodwood." Uh, and I said, if, if I can make that happen for you, you know, do you want, do you want to do it? And they said, yeah, you, you know, can you, can you do that? And I said, uh, I don't know, I'll, I'll try for you. So, <laughs> Yes, I, yes, uh, of course, I'll just wing it, yep. yeah. Yeah, um, so uh, a number of phone calls and emails and uh, I managed to get the car to Goodwood uh, and then I drove, drove that up at Goodwood um, with their father's ashes in the car. Um, so he, he still went up. Um, and then I've, I have did a bit of mini challenge over here in, in the mini, the MW minis, um, and then some demonstrations at the Grand Prix Ball and, and various other events. So I've done some demonstrations with a uh, name you'll be very familiar with, uh, David Brabham um, and uh, Pierre Gasly. So f- a few few others. And yeah, and that led me to get involved with uh, a company called Vool. Um, you probably won't have heard of them, but they're a lightweight uh, Mexican supercar manufacturer. Um, I became their global ambassador. And then um, they asked me to come on and, and put together their, their global sales and marketing strategy, uh, which we did. And then uh, that kind of led me in to do more motorsport stuff and more automotive stuff. Um, working with, uh, you know, I've consulted for a number of big motorsport brands um, on helping them with sponsorship uh, and various others. So, yeah, interesting path. I I wasn't working in the industry when I started racing. I was working in construction. Um, But, yeah, it's kind of led me not only to to racing but into a whole new world. Wow, what an exciting story. Um, So you mentioned that you got sponsorship before you even had a tyre on the track. How did you do that, Clayton? Tell us your secrets. <laughs> yeah, so, so that was based around um, offering both loyalty and uh, business services. So what it is, is I spoke to people and said, look, you know, how, how can I help your, your business? Uh, I've got a little bit of spare time. Um, you know, what, what can I do to, to help your business that would drive value? And I, and I sold it on the basis that um, if you come on board now, no matter where I where I go, whatever I raced, there would always be a, a space for, for them to be involved, you know, whether, you know, I ended up at Le Mans um, or anything like that. And they've only got, you know, a small budget. I said I would always find something for you. And, and that's, you know, part of how I am. I'm very loyal and, and like to, to stick with my sponsors. Um, and that's that was the basis of of where we grew from really and once one or two got involved you know a few others got involved as well then when we were short on budget with the, the tire situation um it was actually raised um a company called machina club um nancy saw that we'd short on budget for tires um because they'd been destroyed in the hot weather the following day uh, and lots of people on twitter club together businesses and brands to to raise the funds to to buy tires so it's a real um yeah we we've been 
fortunate to some extent um, that people have loved it and, and bought into to me and to what we're doing. Um, but that's you know, obviously not without the, the struggles that you kind of keep behind closed doors. <laughs> Yeah, well, that's fantastic that you were able to secure that sponsorship uh, without, you know, even being on a track or winning a race or anything. And in regards to your adventure partner, um, had he had any uh, mechanical background before or how did you guys come about building the car? You said obviously he was two hours before. Um, away and that yes. you put out a tweet there um, and you from construction it was he a mechanic an engineer or just had a yeah. love of a fan as well no so, so he had a motorsport degree which is where the idea came from because I didn't have the the foggiest idea of how to uh, to build a race car so um you know that relied solely on him um but between the, the two of us with the the varying skills that we had, we were able to, to kind of get the finances together to do that. Yeah, and so coming from your background of construction, how did you get into sponsorship? Uh, just had to figure it out. Um, <laughs> you know, it's, uh, it was something if I wanted to, to race, then I had to do it. Um, and, you know, I've never had any training or, or anything like that. You've just got to... I've always been fairly creative. You know, I've got friends in various businesses that will generally put ideas past me or ask me for ideas. So I've always had that aspect. Um, and I just tried to create something different. Uh, obviously, there was a story there as well. Um, and it's how you angle that story and, and utilize that for sponsors. You know, media love uh, a story. Um, so if you can angle that and get industry publications and, and things like that for, for sponsors, then absolutely, you know, it's a good, good value builder. I always say one of my biggest um, or my favorite phrases that I use is it's not what you do on the track. It's what you do off of the track. Um, yeah. Because yes, you need to be competitive on the track, but you can only really drive the value back to sponsors uh, by what you do away from the track introductions and really driving the value back to their business. Um, and unfortunately, lots of people forget that. Certainly now, gone are the days of a sticker on the car. Um, you know, thank yeah. you. That's that's a good deal. People need to see and want to see the value back. And Clayton, obviously, um, you haven't had any formal education around sponsorship, and you haven't been along um, been around motorsports for that long to have that education awareness. Is that something that? you have either just picked up or was that something that was kind of instilled with you from your father saying, you know, network, build relationships, be loyal? No, I think, um, you know, part of it comes from your childhood, if you like, the the values that you're brought up with. Um, you know, I trust and loyalty have always been big. But no, you know, my father's not in marketing or sponsorship or, or that arena. He's in sales, so that probably helps. Um, but yeah, I think you know it's something that I just picked up, um, and and I've always been a networker, um, you know, building building networks, always wanting to learn. You know, if, if I'm in a room of successful business people, then I want to speak to all of them, um, just to learn how they've done what they've done. Uh, and I've always been very driven and focused from from that side. Yeah, and as you mentioned, it's all about having a story to tell and you are known as the Twitter to track man. Um, so did you document that process from obviously the tweet with the Avenger shoes um, to getting onto the track? Like tell us the story, like how did you brand your story? And yeah, so, so yeah, I mean I, I document or track the main points. Um, I did sit down one day and start writing uh uh -huh. writing it all down in, in more detail, but I'm, you know, I'm not the, the best at that. I think, you know, one of the things that I do and perhaps um, something I've picked up quite often is I'm always constantly pushing doors with media, with the sponsors, you know, this is my story, you know, let, can we do something? Um, and I think it, there's probably a misconception or there certainly was around a lot of the people when I first started racing that the media just come to you and, you know, you get these opportunities, just, you know, people come to you if you're winning races. Um, and that's not the case. You know, you've got to get out and work. Um, you've got to let these people know. I mean, I had a friend who was on um, a radio program over here 
and I didn't ask them to go on the show um, because I didn't want to do everything myself. But I contacted the show and, and ended up going on, you know, a fairly reasonable sized radio show to talk about my story and what I was doing. Um, and the first my friend knew about it was the day before when they said, oh, you're coming on our show tomorrow. Yeah. Um, you know, and that's the thing. You've always got to be pushing these these doors and, and pushing the opportunities. Yeah. So um, have you got a good relationship with the media over there? Like how, how have you established, I guess you have, how have you established those partnerships with the media? Yeah. I mean, I wouldn't say they're, they're that established. I have certain ones that I can speak with. Um, that's been very barren in terms of the last 18 months of racing. So you kind of don't have a great deal to go to the media with. Um, you know, I don't necessarily have any real relationships with the media to an extent. Uh, it's just that when there's something there, I, I push out and I tell the story and I say, look, this is what I'm doing now. Come on, come on, be part of it. Um, I'm very fortunate that, you know, through some of the things that I've done through Goodwood, I met you know, someone, Ian Poulter, who's a, a big golfer and he's always been very supportive. Um, you know, through the race of champions when I was uh, the ambassador for Vol. I met uh, David Croft um, and a few of the other drivers and Crofty's very supportive. So I have managed to build these relationships through some of the events and opportunities that I've been at uh, and that, that really helps. And you've gained a lot of ambassadorships um, through your, I guess, um, experience. Um, tell us who are you an ambassador for and how did you decide um, which company you wanted to um, align yourself with? Because I, I feel like that's an area where drivers sometimes get a little bit, um, I guess, confused or uh, reluctant and sometimes they're so eager to say yes because they want everybody to be on board or they want free things, but it's not always the case, is it? No, I think you have to, and it's something that very early on, I, you know, I was taking whatever I could. Yeah. Um, and what, one of the things in one of the frustrations that I certainly have is that a lot of people take on sponsorships knowing full well that they probably can't really drive any value back to that sponsor and they're not really aligned to what they're doing. And the problem is that sponsor is probably very aligned to someone out there that's drive racing and their partners. But by doing that, they do a year and then they've spent all of this money and they've got nothing back. And then that brand disappears out of motorsport and it makes it so much, much more difficult. Yeah. For me, one of the things I decided was to focus on a particular kind of area of people. There's no use working with premium brands and then having some lower level brands in there that aren't premium because there's no synergies with them. I mean, the idea is to try and close the loop. So a lot of the brands that I work with now, they're all premium luxury brands. Um, but they all have synergy in the, the type of customer they're looking at, the type of people that they work with, and also the thought process of what they want to do. Mm -hmm. um, so if you take, for example, um, Yuha Kankinen, you may or may not be familiar with, he's a four-time world rally champion. Uh, he has an ice driving school in Finland. Um, I was approached to go and do some stuff with them um, through, uh, mainly through my commercial stuff, not, uh, not driving stuff. Uh, and then I ended up becoming their first ever uh, ambassador. Well, that fits very well because I operate within a sector where I work with a lot of luxury clients. Um, you know, I do things like the Grand Prix Ball. It's a very luxury event, you know, £600, you know, $1,000 for the cheapest ticket um, for a dinner. And the type of networking customer that I've built are very aligned to these kind of people. So you know, I respect is another one, uh, premium eyewear. Um, they have some great ambassadors as well, musicians, other racing drivers. And then I have uh, Val, who are my nutrition partner. They work with you know British Olympics, some, some major rugby. When you start to bring all of these people in together um, and Yuha wanted to create some video content, I personally wanted to create more video content because it's something I'm not very good at. Um, and the idea is that with all of these brands, with some of their other ambassadors in different sectors, uh, we all have a similar client base that we're aiming for. 
So by combining that together and creating content by getting, you know, some big name musicians, you know, world champion heavyweight boxes, et cetera, all in one place, it's promoting everyone and it's creating this viral content that, that will be very, very beneficial to, to brands, but also the consumer, uh, the, the business done between them and between their own customers will then start to expand into to the rest of the network. 100%. Definitely sounds like you now have a love for marketing. Is this now what you do full time or what, what's your day to day job look like? Yeah, so, um, <laughs> so now uh, I became uh, I'm the commercial director for the world's fastest gamer. Um, basically, what we do with uh, world's fastest gamer is we take 10 of the best gamers in the world, so eight are pre qualified through existing competitions um, where they've won or, you know, that they've, you know, Le Mans, 24 hour Le Mans, they're one of the winning drivers of, of that event. Uh, and then we have two qualifiers who have won through an online mobile, uh, an online competition for R Factor 2, uh, which the finals are held this weekend. Um, so you had to set a time trial lap, and then there was a race between uh, all of the 20 finalists, prizes on offer to win that, and then the winner also won a place in World's Fastest Gamer. Uh, and then there's a, a mobile uh, competition on Gear Club. Um, so it was a, that again. That was a time trial. So the fastest uh, fastest wins a place in in world's fastest gamer as well. So uh, very interesting sector. Uh, season one, Rudy Van Buren won. Uh, he won a contract for McLaren Formula One team as a simulator driver. Um, season two is is bigger. Um, it's a million dollar prize of a year of real racing. So whoever wins will get their race license and then they'll race um, Aston Martins around the world. So it's uh, a phenomenal prize. Shame I can't enter myself, but um, yeah, it's, uh, it's a really interesting sector. It, it moved me into esports a bit, which is something that I wasn't familiar with. Um, but that's a huge market and a huge opportunity and brands have got a, a massive interest in that. Is there any Aussies? Um, <laughs> I don't think there is actually. There's not one. Maybe, maybe they could still qualify. So, um, yeah, if not, the qualifications for season three will begin uh, at the end of September. So um, let's get some, some Aussies in there. Yeah, and I'm running. This sounds fantastic. So how did you, um, I guess, get all these other external partners on board to go ahead with this concept? Was this like a concept that you came up with someone else or obviously um, being the commercial director, you're high up there? Um, yeah, tell us how did, how did it all come about. I'm so excited. I just want to hear all about it. <laughs> just tell me. Yeah, so, so World's Fastest Gamer is a concept uh, derived by uh, – a guy called Darren Cox. Um, Darren was the founder of, um, probably we'll all be very familiar with this, GT Academy, um, which was done with Nissan and PlayStation. So Darren set that up eight years ago. Uh, and when he left Nissan, um, he decided he wanted to do more. Um, so he set up World's Fastest Gamer. Uh, Darren is now also the CEO of Millennial Esports, which is a, a Canadian company. Uh, that has a, a variety of, of businesses within that. So Stream Hatchet, which is like um, the Nielsen of, of eSports. Um, All In Sports, which is a simulator company. Uh, Eden Games, which make Gear Club and another uh, a number of other online games. So it, he's really brought in this collective of businesses that all sit and work side by side to be the leaders in, in eSports. Um, and Darren and, and the, the team that were here already have got a huge experience within that. You know, they've run a number of um, major esports teams for, for big, big brands. Um, so, you know, Darren's a, a pioneer in, in this space in the fact that eight years ago he was doing esports, you know, gamer to racer journeys. Um, you know, now people are only just catching on to, to esports and, and really catching up. So, you know, as soon as the, the opportunity came to work with, with Darren, it was, it was a no-brainer really to, to work with someone that's, you know, at the forefront of that space. You know, he was head of motorsport for Nissan. Um, so he's, he's very experienced. 
Uh, and he, he's also someone that I can learn from, which is the, the key to always, always develop and learn. So no more construction? No more construction. <laughs> no, and I haven't for a while, to be honest, which is, which is good. Um, yeah, no more uh, going on wet, wet so, cold building sites. Oh, yes, cold days, six days a week. <laughs> Much better. Working weekends. Yes. <laughs> um, so Clayton, um, being the commercial uh, director, um, how do you find gaining um, sponsorship is different online? Um, I think like, it's like when it comes uh, to like when it comes to like key benefits and and offerings to um, sorry to um, our prospects. Yeah, I mean, I think it, World Trust of Game and bridges across both um, the online and the real racing sector so there is a lot of similarities you just have a, a whole host of uh, more benefits um i mean world's fastest gamer has huge global tv appeal i mean it's just short of 400 million uh, viewing households you know across fox sports sky sports cnbc spm so it's a huge tv um that, that's involved the opportunities that then come with streaming uh, in the esports sector um, and various aspects like that are huge. You know, you're crossing multiple platforms. If we take the R Factor 2 qualifier that we did, um, the finals just completed on Sunday. Sunday, I think it was, or Saturday night. I've lost track of days with the bank holiday here. Um, you know, the, the, the amount of laps that were completed, the, the drivers attempting to qualify for world's fastest gamer did over two circumferences of the world. Um, and that's how much people want to be part of world's fastest gamer. And it, it's the most incredible prize. Um, you know, when I sit down with potential partners and say, like, you know, we're offering this million dollar prize to race around the world, we're taking some guy, you know, who could be, I mean, an example, so Brendan Lee, who won the Formula One, he used to be a kitchen porter before he won Formula One. Now he's a full-time esports racer. And we're taking that kind of level and giving them an even greater prize in the real world. We're, we're launching someone's career um, by giving them a professional contract. Um, you know, no more, you know, they could be a waiter or something like that in a restaurant. That could be no more for one of these very, very lucky people. Um, so it's a, a huge media story, a huge opportunity. Um, you know, I had judges Juan Pablo Montoya, um, you know, so it's, it's just such a great sell for, for brands because of the exposure, because of the opportunities, because of the assessments, because of the multi, multi platforms and esports is such a huge industry. You know, it's the fastest growing sport in the world. Yeah. Um, uh, it has the, the biggest commercial revenue opportunities uh, in the world as well. Um, you've only got to look at the PwC reports on it to mm -hmm. see, see the phenomenal statistics. So brands want to get involved. They want to find a way in. The problem is a lot of them still don't understand it. So what World's Fastest Gamer does is it allows them a way in using, um, I say, traditional traditional methods in motorsport, but they have the esports as well. So talk us through how does someone get involved in gaming? I mean, there's uh -huh. there's various <laughs> there's various uh, ways from from a simple PlayStation or Xbox to mm -hmm. you know and getting yourself an all-in sports simulator. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the levels are, are vast, um, you know, and as we were saying off air earlier, <clears throat> you've only got to look at the amount of F1 drivers that have been gaming as a hobby for many years, you know, Max Verstappen, Lando Norris, long before they're in F1. Um, and then you even go to the other extreme. So uh, uh, Montoya, he games. Um, Rubens Barrichello is another one that, that, that does get online gaming. Um, so th it's actually a surprising spectrum of just how wide it's not, you know, 16, 17 year old kids and, and younger, you know, is a broad spectrum of people competing in that arena. And it's such a uh, affordable and easy way to do some motorsport, albeit on a game rather than in real life. But if you can end towards fastest gamer, who knows? And is there an age restriction? Like, how do you get to the world fa fastest yeah. gamer? Like, um, obviously, yes, you can have simulators, you can do Xbox, PlayStation, blah, blah. But is it just a competition that you go online or how do you... So, so, <laughs> there's, only, there's two uh, routes in. If, you don't, if you're not already competing in the esports arena, 
uh, and you don't win one of the major competitions, then there's, there's essentially two wild cards. So we either go on R Factor 2, um, which is a PC simulator yeah. um, game, or you go on um, Gear Club, which is a mobile game. Anyone can enter that. Um, you know, the only restriction that we have is an age limit of 18, uh, and that's yeah. obviously due to insurances and liabilities of competing in the final. But, there's, yeah. you know, there's, there's huge cash prizes on, on offer. Um, you know, we give, the, give away over $20,000 um, during the R Factor qualifier as well. So the um, same with just generally, you know, that we're doing things to pioneer this space and get people into it. You know, last week on social media, we gave away a $30,000 simulator. Um, you know, there's huge prizes to help get people into these, these arenas. Um, and that's something that, Darren and, and the rest of the team are, are passionate about is to, to create these opportunities for people that otherwise wouldn't get them. And so how are you creating those opportunities? Are you having the connections at Mercedes and um, Austin Martin? Um, are they coming to you saying we want to be involved or are, are you going to them saying, hey, we can bring you these drivers that have got these skills, we're giving, getting this much TV? Is it kind of like the reverse in, in gaining sponsorship? Yes. You're um, no, I mean, it, it's a bit of both. I mean, people want to be involved with it because they see, or people that know the space want to be involved with it because, A, because we've got, um, you know, the people that are involved in running it, people know from within this space and, you know, having run the GT Academy for many years, they, you know, as I said earlier, they're, they're the pioneers um, within this arena. So people want to be involved. Brands that don't understand it, you know, we speak to, and there's some major brands that, that we're speaking to on on various aspects and it still takes a lot of explaining to these people and to get past some of the conceptions of it's a kid in his bedroom you know playing on his computer um you know there is that level but it's far beyond that as well it's so expansive um but you know people coming around over over in the uk we had four um the Fortnite World Cup I think it was um, and that had TV exposure right the way across every single major broadcaster Um, so it's becoming more and more mainstream in terms of TV um, and and brands are starting to pick that up um, and see the opportunities I mean if you take Fortnite as an example to buy a franchise in Fortnite in 2017 it would have cost you 20 million dollars a year later, Forbes valued that at eighty million dollars. Um, so you can see the the potential and the growth opportunities within the the sector. Um, and I read a report yesterday. I think they think esports is going to be worth three hundred billion mm. in the next five years. So it's, I think uh, I read the same report. Um, so do you do like um, led motorsports as well, offline motorsports? Like, do you feel like there's a big difference, or is esports or gaming just purely your focus at the moment? No, so uh, I'm always, you know, esports is, you know, that's what pays my bills is, is yeah. doing commercials for, for it. Um, but I'm always pushing my my opportunities to get back out in the car and do some racing as well. You know, that's, mm-hmm. I have my goals um, and I, I've been working for, even when I'm not racing and that's what, <clears throat> excuse me, that's what a lot of people don't see is they think, you know, you just get to do racing, that's fun, but they don't see all the hours of hard work that you're putting off of that. And just because I'm not racing doesn't mean that I'm not pushing those boundaries. Uh, I'm always working on other stuff. I have been for two or three years. I've been developing networks for, for that. And that's one of the reasons why you know, Darren came to me to come on board with this because people know the network and the opportunities and the doors that I can open um, because, you know, if it's shut, then I'll find a way to open it. And you've got to have that drive, uh, commitment and, and passion, you know, it's, it's not all glamorous. It's far from glamorous. It's a a painful industry. Uh, can be very demoralising, um, but you've got to keep pushing on. You've got to have that will and that want to to keep pushing and and never give up. As I always bang on about all the time, and um, that that is the case. You know, you've got to be the hardest worker, and you've got to you know not accept no and, and keep pushing. And how long has the world fastest gamer been around? Has it just started? Like, is it are we in year two now, uh, or so, what kind of year? So we're in season two this year. Um, so the first season was twenty seventeen, um, 
nothing was done in 2018 um, and now it's relaunched because it was done with McLaren in 2017. Uh, they then launched um, one of their own separate programs. So it was relaunched again this year, or not relaunched, but season two came this year. Mm -hmm. and it will be a continuous loop now um, every year. So, you know, it's really ramping up um, and you'll hear more and more about it. Um, you know, make, make no mistake about it. It's, uh, it's here to stay and it's going to be a big, big program. Um, there's over 100 broadcasters have already expressed an interest in season two. Um, so, you know, it's over $15 million of global media exposure um, without any in-brand, in-show stuff as well. So, you know, the opportunities are, are huge. Is there any females? Um, have any? I don't think any have qualified. Um, it's not a big sector in terms of female uh, entry in um, in esports yet. Um, mm -hmm. It is growing, and uh, it's something that we've also identified. Um, we'd like to try and help that process if we can. Thank you. Appreciate it. Way we can get help, get more females into it. But what we won't do is, you know, it's not going to be a token gesture just to tick a box and take a PR story. It's got to be. A sustainable you know opportunity for someone that will be competitive and, and there are lots out there um you know but the the pool of females within this sector is obviously a lot smaller than it is with males it's very similar to the whole f1 situation so you know something needs to happen to to be able to get more involved with this but you know it's an easier platform for people to get into. And I think you know female participation in it is only going to grow. Um you know and I'd love to to see a female either qualify through the mobile game or, or maybe next year in one of the major competitions or World Cup, they, they enter, it would be great. Well, it's always been my dream, Clayton, to own a race car team. So maybe I should buy like a gaming team because that's... The yeah, thing. absolutely. If you want to... Maybe um, like I'll get in early and buy a female's team. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, but, you know, it's definitely an early adopters thing. You need to get in early with, with eSports because uh, you can't sit and wait in, in three years to the cost of it will be huge because the the opportunity is so so broad. And so what's your big goal, Clayton? So you've said you'd like to do Bathurst, that's on your checklist, you'd like to come back to racing. Um, you've yep. got an amazing opportunity with work at the moment. Um, yep. what's, what's the next five years looking for yourself? So, so the aim, I think, with every, probably every driver worldwide, but certainly uh, European is, is Le Mans. Um, yeah. To, to do something at Le Mans. Um, Next five years, probably not compete in the main event. I mean, that would be a pretty spectacular uh, opportunity if it did. Um, but certainly by 2023, uh, to maybe do one of the support races, um, that would be would be a realistic goal. Um, and and that for me, that's ten years since that tweet. Um, so it's a nice nice period. I think that's a pretty rapid um, progression, even with with the last eighteen months. So. Yeah, that's certainly the aim. Uh, Le Mans and Bathurst are my two tick boxes to uh, to complete. Well, of course, we'd love to host you over here. So if you do make it to Oz, make sure you give us a call and um, we'd love to meet up face to face. Um, but Clayton, how can people follow your journey or the world's fastest gamer or connect with you? If you've got any questions about getting started in gaming? Yeah, so absolutely. So my personal Twitter is... Uh, Clayton Kingman, um, Instagram Clayton dot Kingman, uh, Facebook is forward slash Clayton Kingman Racing. Um, the world's fastest gamer is uh, at the WF Gamer. Um, you can also visit the website, which is uh, wfgamer dot com, um, and that's got all of the information, all of the various social media channels, lots of activity going. So I, I strongly suggest following those because um, there's some great prizes on offer at the moment. Um, sadly, I'm not allowed to win any of them, which is <laughs> slightly demoralising. But, um, but we yeah. need Nancy to get in there. So all you yeah. um, go and have a look and um, we'll obviously have the links to all of Clayton's details and for the Double F Gamer sites um, for you guys to go and um, connect and follow and maybe even enrol to participate. Yeah, absolutely. That, you know, we, we strongly advise for people. End of September, we'll be opening qualifying for for season three, um, you know, and, and it will be 
probably an even bigger prize for season three if that's even possible. But um, you know, the it's, it's pretty amazing get big. what it is now. <laughs> yeah, um, you know, when when you look at the circuits that they get to do, they're going to get to do Daytona as well, um, Spa, Nurburgring. It's it's a phenomenal prize. Awesome. Well, thank you very much for your time tonight, Clayton. I really appreciate it. No worries. Great and to speak with you. Yeah, I'd love to have you on it again, um, maybe this time next year, just to see how esports gaming's transpired, who's winning in season three. Hopefully there's an Aussie in there that we can even get on to um, yep. interview as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, let's, let's stay in touch and uh, see where we are in, in a year's time. Fantastic. Thanks for it again. No worries, thank you. Well, thanks everyone for listening to this week's show. I really hope you enjoyed that one as much as I did. Now, remember all the show notes with the links and the specials mentioned in today's show are available over at motivatetraining.com.au. If you haven't already, I'd really appreciate if you could head to iTunes or Stitcher, type in Motorsport Coaching, subscribe and leave us a review. Each week, I'll read them out and you'll go into monthly draw to win a fantastic prize. If you have any questions or comments, please email us at motivatetraining.com.au or head over to our Facebook page at Motivate to Tea. Until next time, take care.